What's up, guys? This is David, a.k.a. Reverse Long, and today I got the pleasure of having PJ on the on the podcast. So PJ and Ellis Hobbs. So PJ is the founder of ExoticCarHacks.com, and uh, he also has a watch academy. And Ellis introduced me to PJ uh, because I started to get interested in business credit and all this kind of stuff now that like my life is more secure financially from the success of stock trading. Um, and so... I decided to reach out to PJ after being introduced to him by Ellis because I'm looking for a car, actually. And Ellis was introducing me to all these cars. And like before, these cars used to be like, I used to think of it like unattainable unless you're super, super duper wealthy. But actually, there's a way to hack them. And I've been following PJ on Instagram for a couple of years now. And I started to slowly get educated with this. So when Ellis mentioned it to me, I was like, ah, OK, so this is legit because it, it, Ellis has done it and also has done it on the watch side as well. So with that, we got PJ on the podcast finally to enlighten us and enlighten a lot of traders. I know there's a lot of successful traders that watch the podcast. So now like the successful traders, the traders are getting profitable. They can start to explore ways like in business credit and in business credit to watches and cars and, you know, all this kind of stuff that the, these things are very attainable. Actually, it's way more attainable than you think. And PJ is here to share some of that knowledge and Ellis is very familiar with it. So like, we're going to have a really good conversation. So with that being said, what's up, PJ? How's it going? What's going on, buddy? I appreciate you guys having me on and talk about cars, watches, and whatever else you want to talk about money. I mean, let's talk about money. Yeah. Money is a, an exciting tool we use to do stuff. So let's just figure out how to not only make more money, but let's keep more money in our pockets. That's the key. So while still living a good life, though, that's the key. There there's go. no point in being buried in your bank account, you know? Yeah. So uh, PJ, that's actually a good starting point, man, where um, that was actually one of the things, a phenomenon that I, I mean, you kind of take it for granted. Uh, I know I did personally. Uh, we were kind of talking offline about athletes. And I think that realm specifically takes money for granted in the sense of one, that it's always going to be there. But then two, if you don't use it, you lose it, right? With inflation and everything else. But then more importantly, exactly how you said it to where when we mishandle it or we're just spending just to spend, you're not really using it as a tool, right? And so I've heard you many of times within um, the webinars that you've done, within the, uh, the, the video lessons and all of your trainings of how you're basically parking the money, right? Literally your quote, you parking the money somewhere. So can you kind of explain um, exactly when, when, you're, when you're talking about parking the money in something to get it out later. Cause a lot of people think, well, one, Oh, I'm going to be able to make money off of this each and every time. But really what you're trying to do is just create control risk management, management, which we do in trading all the time. Yeah. So, so what you're talking about here is what I call my wealth transfer methodology, right? It's a very simple concept where instead of spending wealth, you're basically transferring it and are able to recycle it over and over. So let me give you a, a very, uh, you brought up something interesting about athletes earlier and getting in these places where they're not good at keeping their money. So let me break that down for you from a human standpoint, because I write a lot of books on human consciousness too. So there's a little bit of a mindset there that needs to change in the way people look at life, right? So the first thing is when you're an athlete in many cases, not in all cases, I don't want to just say, hey, this is a one size fits all, but the majority of athletes typically come from a realm where they didn't have a lot of money to a realm where they have a ton of money at once, which means it's like a, a much larger gap than the average human who would say, I've had a job and then my job gave me a raise and my raise led me to a business. And so over the years, there is this mental conditioning to how wealth and money works that unfortunately they don't have the exposure to, right? So what ends up happening to people is they get thrown into a sphere of money with a very basic mindset of I make, I spend, I make, I spend, I make, I spend. So hopefully I make more than I spend. So if I make, you know, $10,000, I hope I can spend nine and still float till I make the next 10, et cetera. So this mentality, unfortunately, is not just a problem with athletes. It's a problem with like 90% of humanity who just doesn't want to get educated into their sphere of money because money is just so multifaceted that it doesn't work uh, it, it is the same thing for all people, but there are so many ways to leverage it, change it, recycle it, that most people feel overwhelmed. And so they stick to very basic money principles, even when their money grows a lot, they get very, they still stay conservative. I'm sure you've seen doctors that make like $700,000 a year, 
But like, you're like, hey, you should buy this like really nice Mercedes. And they're like, why would I do that? Like my Kia takes me from point A to point B and, and it's not causing me any problems. It's not costing me anything. And I'm like, yeah, but it is. You just don't realize it. You just think that your payment is the cost. Yeah. And so what wealth transfer does and, and the reshaping of how we look at money is really simple. There are items in your life that you're already using wealth transfer for because you've accepted that they're assets. Those items are something very generic, like your home. Every single person, no one is really afraid of buying a home. Like meaning when you go buy real estate and you're like, I'm going to live here. You typically know that renting is bad and that owning is better. Like that's what the industry has taught you. Owning a home is the better choice. And the reason you know that is because historically, 7,000 times in a row, you've heard that real estate goes up and up and up and up. So eventually, basically, money you put in real estate gives you a return. It's a good investment. On the other side, you've heard that a lot of other things in your life, like luxuries, which have this demonized thing about like, you know, you should spend less than you make. And these things are only for when you get really rich. So those things have been demonized to basically be classified as liabilities, right? And they're liabilities for two key reasons. The first liability is that most people who have owned these things in the 90s, in the 2000s, are the ones spreading these words. And the words are really simple. These things break down. Uh, they cost a lot of money to maintain, insure, and things like that. And so all of that becomes money you're wasting and it's leaving your pocket and you have to be careful. But here's the power of finance. Since the 1990s, things have changed. And yet no one's talking about how things are different. Cars don't break down as much. Two to three manufacturers basically own the entire lineup of cars in the world. So they're a lot healthier and easier to maintain. Uh, they barely cost anything to insure, significantly less than your normal cars because they're less prone to accidents. So you have... All of these things that have changed, even the laws of insurance have changed. People say, well, wait a minute, like, you know, if I insure a Kia, it must cost more because the Ferrari is faster or it has two seats. But right. all of that, the laws of insurance have changed and no one's talking about that either. So the point that I'm trying to make is that the wealth transfer methodology enables you to look at things like cars, watches, art, or anything else that is a luxury, not all luxuries, but the right luxuries as an asset which means that a payment you make towards that, regardless that it's a payment on a loan or that it's a purchase, can actually go and retain its value at the time of purchase. A simple example is this. You buy your home for a million dollars. You live in it for 10 years. You've made payments. They may have been you know, painful to make because they were expensive. They were like five, six, ten thousand dollars $10,000 a month. But at the end, you get back $2.5 million, which gives you those payments back, plus the interest. You feel good about it. The same argument can be made with a car. You can buy the right car, the right exotic car or luxury car, pay maybe a payment of $900 or $1,000 a month, and that might hurt you or feel uncomfortable. But by the time you're done with the car, which is a year later, two years later, you're bored, you want something else, you can dispose of this car and get either the majority or all of your money back that you made payments in the car. Now, the way this works is picking the right car that holds its value over time and something very different than uh, a normal car that loses its value over time. So stop So stop right there, PJ. I want to kind of expand on that. And uh, this is kind of where I started to explain to David and for our listeners. So what he's talking about right now, I'm actually living it and I'm doing it right now. PJ does it at a way bigger scale. But just to give you guys a one-off where you're talking about, say, Mercedes. Mercedes is a very well-known vehicle, very well-known manufacturer. However, there is an array of different models when it comes to the Mercedes truck, right? Let's just say the G-Wagon. There's a difference between, from me learning with PJ, a difference between the 550 and the G63. The, the value of, the, of what he's talking about is exactly that, to where even with the home, if you just buy the shell of a home, it's going to hold some value, but it's not going to hold the same type of value if it has marble floors, if it has all the decked out specifications, things of that nature. So PJ, can you go a little bit more into that now of talking about actual right vehicles and like what to buy? Because a lot of people think, well, oh, if I just buy a, a name brand, I'll be able to not only make money, but make a lot of money 10, 10x over what I paid for it. Yeah. So buying, you know, name brands also have changed in the world of cars tremendously over the last 10 years. You have to understand that Mercedes now makes cars 
for entry level people that are still no different than getting Kias at that same range of dollar, all the way up to what they used to make, which were very exclusive, hard to get cars. So wealth has evolved in the world. So it's now the cost of entry to things has evolved. Ferrari does that too. They make a cheap entry 200K car. In context, that didn't exist 30, 20 years ago. So it was exclusive, but now they're getting market share because there's so many more people with money in the world and they want their cut. So those cars don't qualify, but Ferrari, Lamborghini, Mercedes, all of those brands you love and want are already making cars that still hold value because they're still harder to get and they don't depreciate the same as other cars. So let's use the G-Wagon example um, because you brought that up real quick. A G550 is Mercedes as an entry line truck and then for the G series. And then the G63 is its more flagship race version. These two cars both seem to start at a variant of roughly about 30,000 apart when they're new, uh, like when they're both new. The difference though, is it's much easier to get a G550 than a G63 new. So what happens is the G63 often carries a premium immediately making it hold pricing better. Now, in addition to that, let's look at a used G63. It depreciates more upfront and then stops depreciating after a set amount of time. So as an example, if you bought a G550 new for 180K, it would quickly depreciate to 130 and then down to 100 and eventually little by little make its way out. However, a G63 at 200K would depreciate to 150, hold there for a couple of years, eventually drop to 130 and basically hold there between 115 to 130. So if you bought this car five years later and very few people drive their cars a lot, so you could find a four to five year old G-Wagon with 5,000, 10,000 miles even barely driven, and you could buy it at 50% of its cost. Now, the argument is that, well, that's going to keep depreciating. Well, no, because exclusive and hard to get cars or desirable cars have a following of all type at all time. And this is something that enables normal people to buy incredibly good and cool cars and be able to hold their value. So even though they will depreciate if you put a ton of miles on them, but if you drive them normally, you'll basically won't be at the mercy of what they call time depreciation. Yeah. And so there's actually, um, for again, for the listeners um, who are thinking about getting inside of exotic car hacks or thinking about getting into this world, uh, PJ does a great job of actually drawing out graphs and diagrams of exactly what he's talking about, those curves and those graphs, so you can really get a clear understanding. And it's like anything else, uh, and PJ, you can agree or disagree with this, but from my personal experience, uh, once you start to tune your eye and tune your mind, kind of like you were talking about with consciousness, of like what you're looking for, you really start to gravitate to the right vehicles, right? There may be some bumps and bruises that you take, but that's just kind of you know the tuition that you pay within learning. But if you're following the process and program, that PJ's done and then what I've explained to David, um, it really does become almost like a second nature thing of looking for the right types of vehicles and knowing when to get out of them, knowing when to get into them is literally like anything else. And again, like day trading for us, we study the market and you start to get a pulse on the market and you start to get a feel for what's in, what's not, what's moving, what's not moving, um, who needs what, how do they need it, a lot of different things. But it's like anything else in life. You know, you learn each other, your kids the same exact way by being around them. The more you're around it, the better you get at it. You know, and I, I want to add something that's really interesting is, you know, it's like trading. Right? We're on a trading podcast talking about trading stocks. Your, your first trades are never perfect trades, right? Like you get good at reading data. You get good at knowing when to buy, when to sell, when to exit. But what's really important is we work so hard as individuals to learn how to make money, right? Like we, we, every human on the planet wants to make money. Like every person understands that money is a resource they need to make and be able to garnish more of. But we do such a bad job as humans trying to figure out how to retain our money. Now we know we want to retain it from taxes. So we always try to find experts and people around us that tell us like, hey, uh, here's how you save on taxes. Cause we don't like paying taxes. But here's where the mistakes happen in this trade is that cars and watches, these are luxuries. And so the one thing that happens is whenever we're gauged with the idea of buying luxuries, we get very emotional and need these luxuries right now. And so my training is so much bigger than just training people on how to buy cars or how to buy, you know, watches and, and look cool, whatever. It's, it has nothing to do with that. 
It has to do with retraining people's minds towards spending and how to literally spend on the right things in the right ways to ensure that the money is parked there rather than lost. A good example would be, let's say you've made a ton of money, for example, uh, in trading and you've made it in Bitcoin and Forex and, and regular stocks doesn't make a difference. Whatever it is, you've made that money, it's there. That money is still volatility going to move up and down depending on what the market does unless you manage that money. But if you were afraid of like, hey, I want to actually enjoy some of this money. I don't like looking at it on a computer. I like seeing a big bank account, but I also like a Ferrari. Then my life would get a lot more fun. And trust me, it really does. But let's say you are able to take some of that money and say, hey, I've always wanted a Ferrari. Well, the argument would be the average person would say, by buying a Ferrari, I would lose 300K from my trading account and it would be gone. And therefore, that would hurt me because I can't make more money. But that isn't true. Buying the right Ferrari enables you to move that money from your trading account into the Ferrari, enjoy the Ferrari for a year. And let's say for any reason in a year, you decide owning a Ferrari isn't even for me. I don't want to, or I, I, maybe I, I have other needs now and I'd like to buy a piece of real estate. Well, the money is still sitting in that Ferrari safe and sound. Nothing prevents you from selling that Ferrari, getting your 300K back, put it back to the trading account, put it back in a house, put it in an office, put in another investment, put it in wherever you want. And so having the same type of mindset you have towards making money, but being able to build that mindset towards spending money so that the money can be retained and isn't lost is ultimately the key to, to hacking effectively. And of course, learning how to get in and out of watches as well. Yeah. So, I mean, so the takeaway that I hear from that um, for the audience is delayed uh, learning how to have delayed gratification and then also being able to have knowledgeable perspective of you know, what, is, what is the reality of the situation, meaning the money and everything else. And, and that's actually a good segue. Um, so from the vehicles uh, that I had talked to with David and others and done for myself, um, I was solicited and uh, ended up getting into the world of watches or timepieces as well. And so I've always been a very big timepiece guy. I like to be very transparent with my uh, purchases and things that I've done over the years. I'll be the first one to raise my hand where I was just all about the shiny and bright diamonds, diamonds, diamonds. Right. And I was ready to sell a watch or give it back. And lo and behold, again, taking a $20,000 hair, uh, haircut um, or a punch to the gut, realizing that that Cartier, um, I can't even remember what it was at the time, um, isn't even worth what I thought it was worth. Mm -hmm. And so getting into the realm of, again, the education, the tools, the web, um, the website courses and everything else, I started to understand what watches were valuable, what wasn't valuable, what retains, what, what is more of kind of like a, um, a, a temporary timepiece where you have to move in and out of it pretty quickly, knowing that you have a buyer, being a wholesaler, those types of things. There's a lot of different ways uh, to really make money in that world. And uh, I'll let you start to talk with this, PJ, but I, I've heard you a couple of different times say that you actually feel more comfortable um, talking through the watch piece uh, when it comes to customers or, or I guess students because it's a little easier to move watches per se than an actual vehicle itself. So I look at cars as a wealth preservation strategy. You know, like my trainings don't teach people how to flip cars. And okay. this is a big difference because you have to expect yourself to own the car, drive the car, own it, enjoy it, and then get rid of it. That's a very different model than I bought something for 200, I'm flipping it for 240. Hopefully I got a good deal and I'm gonna make money. Plus you're not a dealer, so you don't have a deal license and the capacity to do that and the cost. So that's not what we teach. We teach the ability to enjoy and preserve wealth true cars because every human's going to own a car anyways. Now, watch watches are basically a wealth creator. They can be a wealth preser preservation strategy as well if you don't really care to trade and you say, hey, I love my watches. I have the same five watches. Uh, that's not what I, I just want to buy watches and have them preserve wealth. You can do that. The same strategy as the cars, but watches have become a huge, huge model for wealth creation, especially over the last decade. They've become a lot more mainstream since COVID and a lot of people now want these watches, generally speaking, so the general public is not playing in this sphere. Uh, and secondly, also watches have always been in scarce uh, supply and incredibly high demand for the right watches again, not just any Rolex. Right. So, you know, one of the arguments is the right watches because of price increases in manufacturers each year is going to go up in value. So even when you sell it used after five years, you're at least going to get your money back out of it. But the argument would be this. 
let's say you wanted that Cartier. Cartier is worth 30 cents on the dollar. So if you see something in the store, basically as $10,000 for a bracelet for your girlfriend, or that you're looking at a watch for yourself, it's worth 30 cents of whatever you're about to pay for it. Now, what if you could buy that Cartier for that 30 cents? You're about to buy a $10,000 bracelet, you could buy it for three. I will teach you that. Now, once you have that $3,000 bracelet, it's never worth less than that. So that you choose to sell it and make a quick 2000 off of it because it sells at 50 cents on the dollar, or that you decide to wear it, use it, give it as a gift and take it back and upgrade it later, whatever it is. Well, buying it at 30 cents on the dollars means it'll never depreciate past that. So the argument is, again, that you use it a wealth preservation by moving your money into it and saying, I want to use this, or that you do it as a wealth creation because you can go ahead and simply move your money into it, enjoy it, and then make money off of it, or just simply flip it to make money off of it, is a personal choice. But watches are liquid. The average transaction can take anywhere from a day, uh, for me, an hour, because I've done this for so long, but for most people, between a day to 30 days to move a watch, uh, the average uh, ROI is anywhere from 15 to 20%, which is fantastic. Uh, anyone with $1,500 access to a post office and a computer can play. Now, you're not going to start at the Rolex level or at the AP level or start getting half a million dollar RMs on your wrist, but you can start somewhere. And that's the argument, you know, just like your trading account's not going to start with a million dollars in it on day one. So, but you can start at some point and kind of start working your way up. And the benefit of it is watches don't have paperwork. So they don't have a ton of stuff going on all the time everywhere. And it's just a very easy model to, to follow in and out of. Now, it's a little bit harder than just saying, I'm going to buy low and sell high. You have to understand what to buy, what to pay, how to negotiate things down, and more importantly, how to ensure that you're buying the right models that are going to be in demand so that you can go ahead and continuously uh, move the money in and out of watches. But both strategies, regardless that you want to preserve your wealth or make wealth, can be used. But watches, I'm a big fan of to make money simply because of the ease of entry and the ease of transaction being very similar to trading, uh, especially for people that enjoy kind of making money from their computer fairly easily. Right. And the, and the last thing that I'll mention, and David, we can get in kind of the Q&A of that, is that, um, you know, a lot of what, what PJ is talking about, obviously, you can hear it becomes very natural. Um, not so much for me, obviously, because I'm, I'm still young in the game. But um, again, similar to trading and how we do that to where David and I, when we're trading, we're basically taking advantage of the ignorant, where someone thinks the stock is about to go up. Us as short sellers, we're seeing the levels differently, knowing it's about to go down. Uh, for me, when I see a stock low, people get very fearful. I'm buying that stock at that time. In PJ's world, in the world of watches and trading, what I think a lot of people need to understand is that how are you able to get these watches, say, for $3,000 or close to that bottom value and then being able to sell it? Um, it's really because of the customers or the people that they're dealing with. And it's the, it's the I don't want to sound morbid when I say this because I mean no disrespect to anyone, but it's the people of ignorance. The people that don't know what they always that, of course. It's the consumer, right? Like the, the consumer that walked in and bought that item for 10000 walked into a pawn shop and only got offered 1800 you know, and didn't understand what other venues do I have? How else can I sell it? And then someone like me offers them two grand and they go, what a better deal than what I've been offered. I mean, look, isn't that what we're conditioned to do? Don't we take our cars to car dealerships and trade them in? Do we ever get a trade-in value we like? Do we ever take a car to a dealer and go hey, I want to get rid of this and buy this. They go, you know what? You've made a great choice, sir. I'm going to pay you twice what you paid for your car when you first bought it. What a great guy. Oh my God, what a good color you bought. No, they're going to hit you with the lowest possible number in the hopes that you're ignorant, don't understand what something's worth and go, of course, I want this new toy so bad that whatever you tell me is worth, you're my friend. You're here to give me my new toy. Why would you ever lie to me? That makes perfect sense, right? And then you go from there, you know? And so it's one of these things where historically speaking, I think that it, it just, we are already doing it. We don't realize that we're already throwing away our money. And so, you know, my goal with these trainings is to help people reshape their minds around money as it pertains to luxuries. Yeah, so just just perspective, like you said, and, and really retraining that brain to get out of that world of comfortability of this, just because I see a brick and mortar store, I see the name, that's pretty much what you're buying. You know, you can get this watch elsewhere. You can get this vehicle elsewhere. But um, that's at the point where you now have to do or have the responsibility and accountability to do the due diligence and make sure you're doing all your uh, your checks and balances to make sure that you're getting actually what you're paying for. So mm -hmm. other than that, um, my first question, and then uh, David, well, David, I'll let you go, man. I know you've been kind of quiet, man, as far as questions go. 
Yeah, I, I didn't realize watches were so liquid. How how are they so liquid? Just flipping them online or, or selling them online or? I mean, everywhere. Just you can go to websites like grailz.com. You can go to websites like ebay.com, chrono24.com, and you'll see there's huge marketplaces for this stuff. It's not it's not like just on Google, like there's a store selling it, et cetera. It's a very, very, I mean, a very traded asset class, and it's happening a lot. Like a lot and, more in the last three years than people ever expected it to. Yeah, that's what I was going to mention. So does this become more popular? Like in the So like what I'm thinking or what I was uh, been observing from somewhere, I forgot where, social media or whatever, that during the pandemic, people educated themselves like on Rolex, for example. And now Rolex is, I know like I'm here in Los Angeles. I think that someone mentioned um, that I know is that I don't even like Rolex anymore because like they can steal them. <laughs> Everybody, a 15 year old knows what a Rolex is now. I can spot them like from a mile away. Um, and so like, did this become a phenomenon? Like during the COVID no, the watches so became, they went mainstream during COVID because a lot more people had money and they splurged more, but it didn't change the fact that I've been trading watches since the year 2000. It's become, it was incredibly popular in 1819. It blew up probably three, four X during 2020 where mainstream media heard about it, you know, and more celebrities were talking about how much money they were making on their watches. So it was becoming more accepted that watches were an asset class after 2020. Gotcha. So that's where, I think, uh, that's where I think trading in this world that you're in, PJ, is synonymous because in our world of trading, when COVID happened um, or before COVID happened, trading was very taboo. It was something that, you know, you're either getting scammed, you're the actual scammer, or you're just going to lose all your money, right? And then all of a sudden, when there was no other option or there was no other means of making money and everybody was sitting at home, Boom, everybody gets these stimulus checks. Now everybody becomes a trader, right? And so similar to that, David, what happened in the watch world is kind of when I got introduced to it, uh, watches and cars, where all of a sudden now everyone became an expert. And I think what even perpetuated that more, and PJ, I, I can remember countless times you talking on the on the mastermind calls of how this is not really normal, guys. Like you should be thinking of wealth preservation versus making money. $10,000, $20,000 $20, on vehicles. Yes, that's good. Take advantage of it while it's here, but just understand that this is not the norm. And so what happened to a lot of people, just like in trading, once that kind of faded and subsided, a lot of people lost their enthusiasm because it wasn't as easy. You actually had to do the due diligence. You actually had to study. You had to do the research. Similar to like we do in uh, trading. Now people are struggling in trading because they didn't have those good foundational habits going forward. And so PJ, for me, do you see a lot of that phenomenon within the, within that space? Of course. Now? I mean, three years ago, listen, the stock market was on fire. So was the car market. So was the watch market. You know, watches were going, you could have bought anything from anywhere and it would have been worth 30% more the next day, you know? Uh, but, and of course, a lot of players come in the game and they spread their bullshit about how they've been doing this. And now they're millionaires doing it. And, you know, they, they quickly try to get the low hanging fruit of people who want to basically, so they basically abuse the market is what I call it. Right. I'm yeah. sure there's a ton of people in the last three years that were expert traders, you know, and suddenly they're like making millions of the stock market. But you're like, what's your track record? Oh, I started in 20 and I already made a million. Yep. Five weeks, you know? uh, yeah. And you're like yeah, sitting we... there like, OK, well, let's see how you last in 23, 24, 25. You know, like, and yeah, yeah. You know, listen, a, a good mortgage <laughs> broker is a good mortgage broker, period. It doesn't matter. Markets are up, markets are down. Foreclosure doesn't make a difference. They're in the business. They have leads. They have clients. They know how to flow works. And, and that's natural in every single cycle and everything else. But I think now people still thought after 2020, like the rise of watches, rises would collapse, like these watches would collapse to zero and, you know, the world would reset. But historically, they never had. So I kept telling people, I was like, why would they? You know, like when, when COVID uh, was introduced in early 2020, I told people, I said, listen, go buy cars and watches. And people said to me, I was crazy. I was delusional. Like the markets are crashing. Everyone, everything's on fire sale. You know, COVID's done. Like basically this new thing's coming, a pandemic. You better sell your cars. We're going to see who's laughing in five months when, you know, your car's going to be worthless. I'm like, okay, whatever. I went and bought millions of dollars in cars and watches. Hmm. Three months later, all those people who thought I was an idiot were trying to buy those cars and watches from me and like double the premiums. So, you know, there, there was a very clean, I made a lot of money in the last three years. You know, I pretty much doubled my net worth between 2020 and 2023. So, you know, the thing that I, I can tell people is that, you know, there is a, a pattern of analysis, just like stocks, you know, just because the markets are crashing doesn't mean Apple's going to zero, you know, 
Uh, and it's kind of the same thing for everything else. Like you just have to learn the ins and outs of the business and you can't be lazy. And at, and it, people ask me, well, is it passive? It can be, but it's not going to be at the beginning. You know, can stock trading be passive? I'm, I'm sure it can, but you have to get really good at it. So you know where your indicators are. So you're not sitting every second in front of your computer. But right. reality is it's not passive during the learning phase, nor is real estate, nor is buying apartment buildings. Like everything requires work until the work turns into, okay, there's a process, the process runs itself, you pay someone else to run it, you're good, you take 80%, they take 20 and boom, you have a business, right? And, and a lot of people don't look at it that way. They look at everything like, I want quick money, fast, but doing nothing. Well, no, nothing's gonna work for you. It doesn't matter. Don't even start watch trading. You're gonna lose a ton of money and basically disappear. But if you want, like you're gonna, if you're gonna buy cars and watches anyways, because why do we get rich? So we can look at bank accounts or we can spend it and enjoy. We get rich because we want bigger houses. We want nicer stuff. We want name brands. We want cars. We want watches. We want to help our friends. We want to help our family members. You know, we want to take care of people we love, right? That's why we get rich. We don't get rich so we look at a bank account and get bigger on a piece of paper. We get rich because we want to be able to have leverage. So when you have that leverage, these worthless things that are cars and watches that are so much fun and yet we're so passionate about them, but yet they're so worthless. You can't get buried with the shit. It doesn't matter. But yet there's so much fun and they're part of the human experience and you have to have them. But the argument is why lose money on them? Why not just enjoy them and, and enjoy them and own them, but yet still allow them to make you wealthier by not losing money on them? Absolutely. Love it, man. Love it. Great, great answer. Thank you. So, so PJ, so for, as an outsider, so Ellis is more familiar with your courses and he's studied all the stuff. So me as an outsider, I just been looking at like, for example, your Instagram. And now since I'm having these conversations with Ellis, he shows me briefly like some images of like uh, certain classes of cars or certain like, uh, let's say like, a, like in stocks, we have a watch list, a certain list of cars and uh, certain like, a, you know, tiers, let's say. Mm -hmm. And I, I notice it's like, OK, so you 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 basically categorize them in a way where like the floor price of a certain group of cars and you drive it for a certain amount of time and you sell the plan is to sell it for a profit so you keep it within a certain mile range so is that like kind of like how it is that's that's so the for cars no so for cars no for for watches yeah you you try to make a profit for cars your goal is not to make a profit it's a wealth preservation strategy your goal is to start by making sure you stop losing and bleeding money out owning cars. That's a complete, so, so you can't go from, hey, I'm used to losing $10,000 a year driving my car to I'm going to turn that into 30K a year driving a car. That That's where people fail and they go, well, this doesn't work. The way it works is you're already bleeding out 10K a month, right? Like for like 10K a year, I'm sorry, for driving a car or whatever. So can we look at that for a second and say, if you're driving a Mercedes and you're losing 10,000 a year, I can put you in a Ferrari and you can lose 10,000 a year. So the argument is, are you going to have more fun with a Ferrari or Mercedes? That's step one. Same loss, way better car. Second approach, what if I don't want to lose money? Okay, no problem. Like you want to lose less money. You want to be smarter with your money. Okay, as you get better, the cars get better. And as you get better, your lending leverage gets better. Your capacity to understand the deals get better. And more importantly, your ability to know what you want as a car gets better. How much do I drive? How much do I drive once I really enjoy my car versus how much do I drive when I don't, you know, and so on and so forth. Do I need two cars, one for daily, one for the weekend? Do I need three cars because I'm really passionate about cars? So once you can make really, you can turn your portfolio of cars just like a stock. You can say these, these stocks or cars are really good for long term. These are really good for short term driving, you know, for the next 12 months and then get in and out. The, the global concept of this, once you get good at it, is to be able to grow an insane collection of cars. And not only not lose money, but make money. But for those people that aren't that passionate enough to have collections of cars, they just want one or two cars. If you can stop bleeding out tons of money and put yourself in a position to enjoy a, a beautiful Ferrari for $10,000 a year, I would argue that that is insanity. You have to think about this, $10,000 a year? Like, like try, to, try to think about that. Divided into, let's say, uh, a, a month, that's $800, $900 a month. Leading on, so so check this out, PJ. You 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 might get a kick out of this. So uh, before I I've stumbled upon your Instagram page and and before I started talking about these things with with Ellis, I was on my own. I was making some money and I was like, you know what? I think I'm gonna go get a Maserati. I always liked Maserati. I was like, you know, the affordable one is the Ghibli. And oh. I was like, 
<laughs> and I was like, we, I we, call it, to, we call it the poverty mobile, you know, like so the, I, I started to see it. What they should. Yeah, yeah. Sure. <laughs> so I started to see it. I was like, you know what? That seems attainable. Let me go for that. And I'm, th- I'm, I'm focused so much on trading, putting money. And I'm like, all right, I'm, I'm thinking about this. Then your Instagram pops up and you're just like, you're shitting all over it. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's the then, absolute <laughs> worst car you can buy. Not only is it the worst investment you can make, but it's also like one of the worst quality product that ever came out of, uh, yeah, so, so I, product. My, my mind was blown i was like what what this guy's hating on the what? then i was like oh it makes sense it's like oh chrysler bought it i think and then you're saying so then i started to understand and then ellis when i spoke to ellis he was introducing to me like the mclarens and it's so much better like and they the pricing it just makes so much sense so yeah, also, look, I mean, I crap on a lot of cars and people don't like it on the internet because it's, I'm basically shitting on their dreams, right? They're like, oh, well, that's the one I can't afford. That's the one I should get. Well, but- PJ, PJ, let me stop you right there. It's, it's, um, Cause I want you, I want you to expand on that, but it's not that you're shitting on their dreams. What you're really shitting on is their ego because they thought that they had a certain vehicle that gave them a certain status. But when you, when you well, no, no, they had a vehicle. path, they had a path to a vehicle that, that was basically what I call a cheater vehicle. And nobody likes to hear that that path just got longer. So, you know, you can get to a Ghibli in, in a year, basically like $500 a month. Like basically every peasant in the world can get there. You know, it's not that hard. But if you have to look at it, like you, you have to look at to really have a real Maserati, which just to be fair, 99% of Maserati line is complete garbage. So to have a real McLaren, to have a real Ferrari, to have a real thing, you're going to have to figure out how to get yourself to a 250K, 200K to 300K game. That's the game of exotic cars. Everything on, like that's the beginning. Like that's the birth of the beginning is like 200K. Anything below that is basically your training wheels. You're on a little bicycle trying to figure it out. But But people know they can get to the 150 but but when they when you're like hey you got to get to 300 they're like well i'm so far from that i'm not sure i'm gonna get there so who are you to shit on my dream because I, i've gotten it now so so people have this misconception you're correct it hurts their ego because their self doesn't believe they can actually get there so what ends up happening over time though is that's what i was telling you at the beginning when we were before we we're on on live money has no feelings the moment you start making it about what it means to you, you're already lost. It, you're already lost. The mindset of a good trader is to know how to get in and out of positions, not what these losses mean to them, because the losses get worse once you feel bad about losing something. Yep. You know, like you have to be able to say, hey, I know this stock's going down. It doesn't matter that you're about to lose 30 grand because you're about to lose 50 if you don't make that call, right? So then you become hopeful about it. It might go up. It might that. Da- but it still doesn't change the fact that you need to get out of your position now because you can rebuy later, right? So the moment money becomes emotional, you lose. So the moment you become, it's about my Ghibli, it's about my Boxster, and you know this is my dream. It's not. There, yeah, there's that's literally one of the things that we up. talk about. That's actually one of the things that we talk about um, within our um, within our group collectively of how um, we're, we're not going to allow you to pull emotion into the actual trade. So. Uh, in our world, people are, oh, man, I wish I would have bought here or, you know, this sucks or like, you know, just real depressive, pessimistic stuff. Right. And so, again, like you just said, the market is just a reflection of what you're doing. It has no emotion behind it. It, is, it isn't pinpointing you out. It isn't locking in on your trade. The same thing with these vehicles, um, with these dealers, the same way that they're lowballing or, or giving a certain number here, they're going to do it to the next Tom, Dick and Harry. Right. It's Always, just, that's their job. It's, it's, their it's, job is to buy low, sell high. They're dealers, right? And the moment you get emotional about like, well, I thought he was my friend is the, the time you're screwed. You know, like the moment you think, I mean, listen, I've had friends in this business for like 20 years. And you know what? They'd still make a hundred grand off of me in a heartbeat. They wouldn't look at it and be like, I'm your friend. I'm not going to feel bad once you friend. It's just business. That's why I'm saying you're an idiot to think otherwise. You know, like you have to just understand that that's the norm. And your job is to be educated and not fall for it. That right. education is available online. You know, that, that there is a lot of that education that's available free. You don't even need to join my community. To get educated about something is you can go out there and investigate, and it takes time, or you can join a program as an example like mine and basically get all the information presented for you so you save time. But reality is, can someone within the next five years really go and decipher everything I teach in my course on their own? Sure. Right. Is that worth it for them to save $300? I mean, I don't know what kind of work they're doing, but five years for $300, I would argue is a pretty bad bet. You probably shouldn't be looking at a Ferrari, right? You Maybe time to get on a bicycle and figure something else out, you know? 
Yeah, it's funny uh, with stocks. Okay, so I was listening to a podcast and there was one trader. He said he didn't invest. He was proud. Like I never signed up for any mentor, or any education. But then at the end, he he admitted that uh, he lost 150k and then like had to grind back up. So basically, he paid 150k for his education. He learned the hard way. Right, and he could have paid probably five grand for a course somewhere too. Yeah, grand. exactly. Like being exactly. part of a group, some support network, and so on and so forth. And exactly. the argument is, you know, online education has a bad uh, juju to it because of two folds. First off. There's a lot of scammers in the world of the internet. That's just a very common thing that happens. Whenever you have a free speech platform like that, you got a ton of people that believe their voice should be heard. But then secondly, you, you also have to understand that people aren't used to prices of education today. They've grown in a world where college costs $40,000 a year. You're saying you're going to teach them something for 500 bucks. How good could that possibly be? Well, well, I mean, YouTube's free. How good is YouTube? I'm pretty sure everybody else uses it. You know, like... What I'm saying is the the argument is again like people aren't adapting fast enough to how the world is changing, and regardless that it's finance, how you learn, what you're learning, these things need to change. And so you know I've made my pledge 20 years ago to basically teach the internet what I know. I've thought the same thing for 15 plus years. You know I haven't stopped. I haven't changed my tune every week. I don't have something new. I teach. I teach cars. I teach finance, and I teach watches in that realm. That's what I do. And so I've gotten really good at it, and I hope more people will basically want to learn that concept so that as they get richer trading, they're not wasting their money and having to trade more to make more instead of just being able to enjoy more. Awesome. And and lastly, PJ, I want to touch, okay, so business credit, I know you've mentioned it a few times on your Instagrams, like uh, your business credit grows with, with uh, the, if you get, you know, with the exotic car. How does that work? Because I started to get into this world of business credit that Ellis introduced me to. Um, so it so doesn't have to be business credit. It can also be personal credit. The point is that one point of leverage for credit is obviously home ownership. You know, it plays a big role. But it, car ownership also plays a big role, especially as the values go up there. So, you know, you have to start at a smaller loan size, like 50K. But one of the things that we teach you in the course is how to double or one and a half X your loan size with each and every time. So if you start at a 100K loan, how to go to a 200K loan next car in six months and how to go to 250 300k loan the following time and so on and so forth. So I've had kids that were like 21, 22, starting with the program and very limited credit leverage, you know, because they obviously didn't have a, a lot they built. They started with a 100k car putting 20k down, you know, and within three years, they were driving a 600k car. So and each time they made money, so they didn't care. It's not like they were losing money by having these large payments. But the argument was, again, that even that person that had very limited credit, still can start and build off of that. And ultimately that leverages in all aspects of your other life too, you know? Awesome. Yeah. As a testament to that, uh, PJ, um, again, salute to you, man, to where I had never, I, I had never been in a position where I wasn't having to put money down on a vehicle, but because of how I positioned myself with credit, what I was able to show um, that G wagon or that G63 that I was able to um, enjoy uh, for the time being, um, literally no money down with maybe like a $1,200 payment. And I was able to come out of that vehicle, not only getting all my money back, but I ended up making right around 5,000 on net. I mean, you know, that's the, the, the beauty of it is that the more information you have, the more it compounds, right? And the better it gets and the richer you get and so on and so forth. So it's a never ending cycle, but you have to get just as good as learning how to save money than how to spend it. Absolutely, man. I 100% agree. Awesome. Well, PJ, that about wraps it up. Um, we'll, we'll have all your information in the show notes. And thank you so much for taking the time to come on and share that wealth of knowledge. I appreciate and, it. And best of luck to everybody. Hopefully more people out there are saving money and still continuing to grow and enjoying their life along the way. Awesome. Keep Thanks, being guys. Direct. Keep being direct. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Take care. Bye, Bye man.